this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is the NZXT H7 Flow RGB, seen here with the NZXT Kraken 280 Elite RGB and some core fans, as well as a Gigabyte 3090 graphics card and a Gigabyte motherboard, and you'll see all the glory of the build here and the specs in the description, both of the build and of the case. But in this video, I'm going to be talking to you about the setup of this case, how to do it, the logic of the wiring and setup for it, and all the different features of it and more. Now, I've done a video previously on the previous H7 Flow, so the standard non-RGB version of this case, and I'll link to that in the description because it did have a slightly different build on it with Lee and Lee fans and a 360 mil radiator instead of a 280. So if you're interested, I'd recommend checking that video out because I've gone into a lot of depth on all the different setup process for it and the logic behind a number of different things and the different ways you can set things up. But the RGB variant of this case, as you'll see, comes with three 140mm fans on the front, and those are the RGB core fans, and then a single non-RGB fan at the rear. So you actually have quite a few fans as standard, which is nice, and also some pretty nice looking ones, as you've seen in the beginning. This case is available in black and white. The black version is pretty stealthy and straight out of the box. And it will support a number of different things. So you can fit up to a 360mm radiator on the front or on the top. And you can do push-pull setup on the front, but not the top. So it's worth bearing that in mind that you can set it up. And I am going to do that. So the 280mm radiator that you saw at the beginning, I actually end up with four fans on it. That's four 140mm, two on either side. So there's a lot of things to think about there. And I'm going to demonstrate how to do that and why you might and the sort of logic of it. But I want to show you a number of different things. So you can see that you can pull off all the different panels. There's a number of different dust trays included in here as well. So that you can easily access things. You'll see there's two USB-A connectors on top and a USB-C as well. So you've got good front panel connections. And then these fans are already pre-installed and also semi-pre-wired, which is interesting. And I'll explain more about that in a minute, but basically they're already daisy chained together with a five volt RGB connector that plugs into your motherboard. So theoretically you can easily connect these up. But I actually ended up using NZXT's RGB controllers that come with the core fans and with the cooler to sync the lighting up across multiple different fans and use NZXT's cam software to control it. And I do think that's the better way of doing it. So I'll show you that later on and talk about it. I've also done a separate video on how to wire these fans and the logic of them. So be sure to check out links in the description to other related videos you'll find useful. Now this case has a number of nice highlights of it, very similar to the original Flow. The RGB version is basically just the addition of RGB on the front, but you can see if you pull that back one off, you've got multiple different cable channeling sections in here and Velcro ties and areas where you can run your cables through and then tie them down. Out of the box, it looks fairly neat and fairly straightforward. Lots of space and a reasonable setup. There's also room for potentially four 2.5 inch SSDs and two 3.5 inch hard disk drives. You'll see down the bottom, there's a little cardboard case tucked away in the hard disk drive bay, which has all the hardware in it. You need extra screws and things. And then the front panel connectors, which once you pull them out of the bag, look quite intimidating, but I'll show you where to connect up a lot of these as we go through the video, just to make life a little easier. One of the things of note is the front three fans are daisy chained together with this sort of splitter cable. So three power connectors into a single connector that would plug into a system fan header. And then you have these RGB connectors. So the RGB side of these fans is wired into this five volt connector, which plugs into the motherboard. So as standard, they're pretty much set up and ready to go. You just need to connect those up to your motherboard if you're planning on just using those and then maybe mixing in some other fans. So this cable will obviously plug into your motherboard and I'll show you where in a second. And then you can control the lighting through your motherboard software. If you've got an NZXT motherboard, obviously that'll be through cam. If you've got another motherboard like with Gigabyte, for example, you'd have to use Gigabyte's own software. And you can see that you'd use the five volt header as I've just done there, which is on the top. Now, some of the front panel connections, just gonna show you those quickly. So this chunky one is the USB-A. So that's for the two top USB-A connections that plugs in on the right hand side there and then you've got this smaller one for USB-C which plugs in below it the front panel connector plugs into the bottom right that's the power button and that needs to be plugged in down the bottom there 
and then the HD audio, which is a 3.5 mil jack plugs in the bottom left. I've done a full wiring guide on where to connect up all the different cables for your case. If you want to find out more about that and see that in more depth, again, you'll find that link in the description below. So in the cardboard box, you get a number of different things, including multiple bags of screws, which are all conveniently labeled in terms of the size, and then a little bag which has some extra SSD trays in it for mounting more SSDs in the case if you want to. I am going to show you where to mount a hard disk drive and an SSD just for demonstration purposes. But what you'll see by the end of the build is if you're copying what I'm doing is there isn't actually much space for SSDs and hard disk drives by the time you've finished because there's so many different RGB controllers that need to be put in the case. There's just not much space left by the end of it. But you can remove the tray so you can take out the hard disk drive tray, which is probably worth doing if you're not using hard disk drives. This is a thumb screw that holds it in place, you can get that out of the way and that gives you the ability to then put cables down there or more things. But I'm gonna quickly show you how to install the drives if you are thinking about doing it. So refer to the manual that's included because it shows you what screws are what, what they're labeled for, and which ones do what and where they go. But for reference, the M3 by five millimeter screws are for the SSDs, and then the screws marked 6 to 32 x 5 millimeter are for the hard disk drives. The ones that are used for SSDs are also used for mounting the motherboard to your case as well. So make sure you don't lose those. Keep that for later on. And I'll show you that process as well. So for hard disk drives, they basically just slot into the tray and then they're screwed in. And you can see you can basically line up those drives with the sides there. And then you've got six screws on either side that you can then screw in and tighten it down. Obviously, you can fit two drives into this caddy and then you can replace it back into the case and connect up the relevant cables. So you need SATA power from your power supply unit and then a data cable that goes from this to the motherboard. And as I said, I've done a wiring guide on these things. If you need to know more about it, that I'll link to in the description. But fairly straightforward. Now, it is pretty basic, but it does work nicely. The SSD trays removed from the back of the case, as I've shown. So you basically held in place with a screw and a couple of clips. So you can essentially quite easily take those off and then mount your SSDs. Just mount it so it's facing down towards the bottom of the case because then you can plug in the power cable. Again, this requires a SATA power connection and a data cable to connect up to your motherboard. And then you would use these screws to screw it into place. So this has four screw holes that screw that down. The standard and simple installation is for two of these. So you'll see there are two caddies that are basically attached to the back of the case and you can pop them into place. Once you've done that, you can then just reseat the thing so you just pop the hard disk drive tray back in and screw it down now we'll note there is a fair amount of space here and obviously the positioning of this drive bay means that the bottom front fan is actually blowing cold air onto it immediately so that's quite nice so you've got good airflow for your hard disk drives the ssds not so much because they sit behind the motherboard but that's not too much of a worry i've never seen a problem with this anyway you then just seat the ssd back down and then screw it down so there is a little screw that holds it in place there but they are clipped on you can see obviously you could just put two here if you want to then we're going to mount the power supply unit and that has some hexagonal screws that are used to secure that now for this i'm using the rm 1000e from corsair which is a thousand watt modular power supply unit. I've done a detailed guide on this, the setup process for it, and all the wiring of the cables. If you want to know more, I'll link to that video as well. And essentially what you're just doing is you're making sure that the fan faces down towards the bottom of the case, and then you use those hexagonal screws to secure the four corners to hold it in place. The mounting of it might look a bit odd when you've seen that the labeling on the side is upside down, but this is designed because the cold air is being pulled from the bottom of the case and then warm air is blown out the rear here where you can see where the power cable attaches. But you'll notice that there is a dust tray underneath the PSU, so you can see that quite easily. Now I'm gonna show you some of where you'd run the cables. So we've got two eight pin CPU cables from this power supply unit, and you can run them along the side. You'll see that you do have multiple Velcro ties, and the benefit of this PSU is the cables are also nice and flat and fairly flexible. So we can secure those and they don't take up much room. The 24 pin cable, however, is a chunky beast and it does require some manipulation, but it is actually pretty well thought out the design of the channeling, as you can see, it does sit in there nicely. And we've got SATA power. So this is what I was talking about earlier on. This is a flat 
connector that works for the hard disk drives and for the SSDs. So you can connect that up to the hard disk drives and SSDs if you're mounting those and it just slips in. And then you just need data cables from each of those to go to the motherboard. These are L-shaped cables, but you can daisy chain multiple devices to them so they can be used for RGB controllers and things. I actually ended up needing two of those cables though, so it's worth noting that. Now for this build, I'm using Intel Core i5-13600K along with a Z790 motherboard from Gigabyte. And I've done videos separately on this, but I want to show you the installation of a few different things. So when you pop the cover off, you'll see the pins are on the motherboard. So you very gently need to seat this CPU down with the gold arrow pointing into the bottom left corner. Very gently put that in there. You can't put it the wrong way around because there are notches on it. And then just replace the lever until that cap pops off. And then that is nicely secured in there. We're going to use a single NVMe SSD for this build. And this board actually has a very nice large heatsink on it. I've done detailed guides on whether heatsinks are worthwhile and also whether you should peel stickers off your NVMe drive as well that you might be interested in. But I'm using the Corsair MP600GS drive for this, which easily plugs into the top slot. And these NVMe drives make life a lot easier because you don't have to worry about cables. I'm also using Crucial's DDR5 Pro Series kit, 32 gigabytes and just two pretty casual looking sticks with no RGB lighting, but solid performers and reasonably affordable too. When you're plugging these in, make sure not to make any mistakes. So for your standard dual channel memory, they'll actually pop into the second and fourth slot on here. And that ensures that they'll run at the right speeds and that you can get XMP running and you'll get good speed out of them. Don't use the first slot. Don't make that mistake. It's second and fourth. Now for this process, I said I'm using the Kraken Elite 280, which is a 280 mil all-in-one cooler from NZXT, which is fantastic looking. And as you saw at the beginning, it has its own little display as well. It has pre-installed thermal paste and it's set up ready for Intel. So it's perfect for this build. If you're doing AMD, I've done a detailed guide on this cooler and how to set it up for both Intel and AMD. But in this video, I'm gonna show you just the various steps that I'm using for this Intel build to make life a little bit easier and more straightforward but you'll see that there's a connector on the top here and that allows you to connect up a breakout cable which then has multiple different connections now i said at the beginning of this video that i've done a separate guide on the original h7 flow in that i used a 360 mm radiator on the top of the case and i think that's probably the most sensible mounting and a 360 mm radiator might be a more logical choice for this but i had a 280 mil and i wanted to try push pull and so I'm setting it up in the case and I'm gonna show you why and how in a second. But this all-in-one cooler has a fairly interesting setup in that you connect up this cable here and you can see there's multiple different connections on it that look fairly intimidating, but actually the logic for it is straightforward. So you have this single small cable that plugs into the AIO pump header or CPU fan connection on your motherboard and that allows your motherboard to recognize and control the speed of the pump. You then have a USB connection that runs to the bottom of the motherboard. I'll show you where in a second and that allows you to control the lighting and other things via cam software. You've then got a SATA power connection which gives you the power from your power supply unit that powers both the pump and the fans and then you have a breakout cable which is three connections for fans. Now Standard installation, you'll just be using two. So you can see you've got a single cable here. This is the power connection for a fan, for example. So these fans have both power and RGB cables separately controlled. So the fan power connection connects up to the pump head and then the RGB connection connects up to an RGB controller, which I'll show you in a second. So you've got four cables to deal with, two from each. But this is the RGB controller, which you'll see has three connectors on it. As standard, so you can actually connect up three fans on this. But if you're just doing the standard two, you just plug that in and that's the RGB control, but that also needs to be connected up to your motherboard and to SATA power. So more on that in a second. But this breakout cable means that you can control the fan power and it's all sort of one closed system which makes life a little bit easier. But you'll see that one of them has four pins on it and the other two has three. And in this build, I'm actually gonna run four cables into this breakout cable. So we're gonna have four fans all powered by the pump head, controlled by it and through that dedicated system. I'm gonna to have to use a splitter cable that I'll show you later on in order to do this, but it is possible to do. 
Now this cable has three connections on it. A 360 mil radiator would have the same. So if you are going to use a 360 mil, which I suggest is actually the more logical choice, perhaps get yourself a nice one of those new crack and elite coolers, but the 360 variant top mount it and then put three fans on it and you'd have a very nice setup. And you can see the connections for it would basically be the same as this. So you'd just connect up those three cables in this instance to the pump head. And everything is all controlled in that one system, which makes life really straightforward. This is a brilliant cooler that I'm a big fan of because it allows you to do lots of different things. So you can put GIFs on it, but you can also have a display which shows you the temperatures of both your GPU and CPU at the same time at a glance. One of the things I really like about it, design's also really nice. It's a nice quiet pump that runs really well and gives good cooling performance. So this is the basic installation without the push-pull setup. You'll see I'm just showing the wiring logic of how that works. RGB to the RGB controller, fan power to the pump head, and then you just need to make sure the pump's connected properly up to the motherboard and to SATA power. And that's one of the most important things. Make sure that you've got enough connectors for that SATA connection. So this is that flat power connector that runs to your PSU. And that ensures that both the pump and the fans are powered. Without that, the whole system won't run properly and your CPU will overheat. So make sure you've got those connections. And then I want to show you the basic connections to the motherboard as well to make this really clear. I'll demonstrate it when it's in the case, but I want to show it here now so it's easy to see. So that single small tiny cable that connects up to either CPU fan header on the motherboard or all in one pump header or system pump header. Look out for those. You wanna check your motherboard manual depending on the motherboard you're using. You can see this is Zeus one, for example, as AIO pump in the top right. The Gigabyte one has system fan pump on the bottom right. Or you could just use CPU fan, which is usually on the top right. Then the RGB controller for the RGB side of the fans, that plugs into the USB header, which is in the bottom middle of most motherboards. You usually have two connections on there, so you can plug that in there. This is important because that ensures that you can control the RGB lighting through the CAM software. And then again, that requires SATA power. More on that later on, because you're going to need a lot of SATA power if you do the same build as me and a lot of USB connections as well. So for the setup of this cooler, you need to install a backplate first if you're using the same build that I am. So this is an LGA 1700 socket motherboard, which uses this Intel backplate, which goes on the rear. You push the pins out to the four corners to the furthest possible points. And then we're basically just seating this down and putting it on the back. And what we're gonna do then is you're gonna use some standoff screws on the front side to secure that in place. So you then seat the pump head down over the top of that. So it ensures a good connection with the CPU so you can get nice cooling and good thermal performance out of it. You can see the way we've done that here. It's easier to do it before you mount your motherboard in the case because it makes the process a lot more straightforward. So you can see the standoffs uh, come in a little bag marked Intel 1700 and they basically just screw down so make sure you secure these as tight as possible into those four corners so that it's all set up and ready to go this is basically preparing everything that's ready beforehand now again you don't need to worry about thermal paste on the cpu because it's pre-applied to the pump head so that's ready to go so you don't need to worry about that. Now for this build process, as I said, I'm going to do a push-pull setup. And that's because there's already 140 mil RGB core fans on the front, which is the same as the core fans that are on the radiator. So I figured I might as well use both. So yes, one set's black and the other set's white, but you're not going to notice that once in the build. So what I'm doing is I'm removing two of the 140 mil fans from the case. So they're on the fan tray. They're installed with the small screws. As I said, these are already wired for power and the RGB connection. So you actually have to remove them from those cables that I showed you earlier on. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to mount the fans so that they're both facing the same direction. So you can see that I've set this so that basically I'm intaking air through the radiator. So the white fans in this position will be sucking air through the radiator. And then the other fans that I'll mount on the front of it will be pulling it through as well. So they're both helping each other to basically pull air through the system. You don't have to do this. I just thought it was worth demonstrating how you could do it and also how there's enough space to do it if you want to do it. There are some considerations though, so stick with me because I want to show you that there isn't much space at the end. I tried to fit a 4090 graphics card in here after doing this and it wouldn't fit. So just bear that in mind. However, I did get a 3090 in as you've seen, so 
something to consider. So what we're doing is we're rethinking the logic of how this is going to work. So I'm using these top fans for the push-pull sort of setup, and then the bottom fan will still be run by the system fan headers and the RGB control. So fairly straightforward. But instead of using the small screws, I'm now using the long radiator screws. And there's actually enough screws included with this all-in-one cooler that you have enough screws to do this. So they actually include extra screws. So I'm now using those long radiator screws to go through these black fans, through the fan tray and into the radiators uh, to hold the radiator onto the fan tray. If you're going to follow this logic, make sure you install the fan tray and then put the radiator on the back of it and screw it down. I tried doing that the other way, mounting the radiator to the fan tray and then putting the fan tray back in, but it wouldn't work because it wouldn't quite fit because of the design of the rad. So it wouldn't sit high enough. But you can see now that I've got a mess of cables to deal with because we've obviously got a lot of cables because you've got loads of RGB cables and loads of fan power cables because we've got four fans instead of just two. So we now need more RGB controllers. These are magnetic though, so that's a benefit. Now one of these comes with the cooler itself and one comes with a triple fan pack if you buy it. So if you need extra, it's possible to get these. Unfortunately, they only control three RGB fans each, and they also have one SATA power and one USB connection per controller, which does cause some complexities that are worth noting. So what I'm doing is I'm plugging in the RGB cables from each of those fans that are connected up to the radiator to these two controllers, but obviously also all the other RGB fans in the build are going to need it too, because I am going to put three more of the RGB core fans on top of the case, and we still have that front fan that's also at the bottom of the front on that tray as well. So that'll need powering too. So you can see we've got a spitter cable here for connecting up the push-pull setup. I'll leave some links in the description so you can find something similar. Essentially, you can get cables like this that either take two or three fan cables and then put them into a single connection. You can use this in this instance to connect the pump head, but they can also be used to connect up to the motherboard if you're doing it with simple case fans. And I actually do use one of those a bit later on to connect the rear fan and the front bottom as well. So now the other thing you can do obviously is top mounting three 120 mil fans in this instance, instead of a radiator. I was concerned with that front radiator placement, they wouldn't fit. So test fitting those is worth sort of planning out your build beforehand to make sure this is the case. And you can see that that front one is a little bit blocked, but it is still possible to do this so you can actually fit those fans in there. So I wanted to check that before I went about installing them. The idea here is to top mount those and have them set to exhaust. So we set them face down so that they pull air through the top of the case and exhaust the hot air out. Positioning them, you can see that you can fit 140 mil fans on the top. So there's actually two lots of attachments here. So you could put 140 mil out there instead or a 360 mil radiator, as I mentioned earlier on use those small screws that I just showed to mount those in. The fan screws come included with the motherboard, so they're in there. Reference that manual again to see which ones you'd want to use, but you're just basically placing these in, taking care, obviously, to run the cables to the back. Now, these RGB core fans and the triple pack come with the RGB controller, so you've got the RGB control there, but obviously they need to be powered as well, so I need to make sure that they're connected up and run. As I said already, I've done a guide separately on this and how to do it. You can get RGB and fan power controllers from NZXT, which should make life a little bit easier. But you can also just run them up to system fan headers on your motherboard too, and set those up. So now we've got most of that build done, we're just gonna go about installing the motherboard and plugging in all the cables, getting it ready to go. So the installation for this is fairly simple. This is an ATX motherboard, and the standoffs and screws that you need are ready to go. So you can just basically slip it in, taking care to put the IO shielding towards the back of the case, and gently seat it down. Then make note once again, as I said, 632 by five millimeter screws, the same ones you'd use for the SSDs are the ones you'd use to mount the motherboard to the case. So we've got to screw those in multiple different holes across here in order to be screwed in. Now, a few other things of note here, you'll see that despite that push-pull radiator setup, there's still plenty of room at the front and you can see we've got that cable hiding tray to the left-hand side of that with plenty of space there too. So it's actually quite a roomy case. Now we're connecting up that power cables that we ran earlier. So the two eight pin CPU power cables run to the top left and plug into the motherboard, assuming that you have two. 
If you have one eight and one four pin, you can split these cables in half, by the way, so that's worth noting. And now we're going to seat the pump head down. So remember to take that plastic cap off, obviously, and then we're gonna position the pump like this and that and then seats down over the top. Now you can actually position it in different ways if you want to and then you can rotate the display in cam software that's worth noting. So we put the pump head down and then use the thumb screws to secure it in place. Go diagonal across each corner so top right bottom left top left bottom right. We need to secure this down firmly and tight but be careful not to over tighten it because you could potentially damage the pins on the motherboard so you do need to take care when installing this but also if you don't secure it well enough then there's not good contact with the CPU and the pump head and then that could end up not cooling the CPU as much as possible. I've done a video previously on the problems to avoid with your all-in-one cooler and you actually one of the simplest things that you can do is not securing it properly and then it ends up just getting too hot. So if you do find your CPU is running too hot it's either that or maybe the thermal paste has been damaged during the installation process. Those are some of the most basic things that you can accidentally do without realizing. So obviously we need to make sure all these cables are connected from the pump head as I mentioned already. So we've got to run these through to the back. There's a lot of cables here and it can look a little bit messy but there is plenty of space here fortunately especially without a radiator mounted on top. If you were top mounting a radiator you may find that it's best to sort of run as many cables as possible to the motherboard first and then install the radiator afterwards because that will give you more space because you can see obviously with a radiator mounted on top instead of just exhaust fans you probably have less space to manipulate things around. You can see that here it's fairly easy though it's quite straightforward. Just don't forget to plug in the CPU or all-in-one pump header cable and then run the other cables to the rear and we need to make sure they're all connected up properly. So we've got those three RGB fan controllers and three of those obviously means a lot of USB cables and a lot of SATA connections. So you've got a lot of fans to deal with. Obviously, we've got the three front ones, two on the radiator and then three on the top. So that needs multiple hubs in order to connect those up. And then you've got lots of things to deal with. Now, chances are you don't have that many USB headers on your motherboard. So in this instance, I'm actually going to be using a Corsair hub, which is four USB connectors into a single connector. This makes life a lot easier. NZXT also sells a similar device. I've done a video on that previously, but basically you just plug in multiple different things into it and that makes life a lot easier. But as you can see, with all these different devices in there, I've actually had to remove the SSD. So there's not a lot of space if you are throwing in lots of RGB. And I think that's worth bearing in mind that you need to think about just sort of how much you're putting in. So how many RGB fans and sort of what other hardware you're putting in there that might end up resulting in there being a lot of mess now the back. Now there is potential for doing other things. If you're not using a hard disk drive, for example, you could nestle some of these controllers down the bottom in that little bay at the bottom there where the PSU is. So maybe you can manipulate things around and still use an SSD, but it's worth keeping that in mind. So the single USB connection that comes out of that Corsair hub then plugs into the bottom of the motherboard as I showed you earlier on. So bottom, middle, you need to make sure that's connected up like this so that it then gives you control over the RGB lighting for both the fans and for the pump from the cam software. I would actually recommend installing the pump directly into the motherboard though rather than via the controller so that way the fans are controlled by the controller but the pump head itself is controlled by the motherboard directly. And then you can see SATA power so make sure everything's going to up SATA power connections. Now we have three RGB hubs, the USB hub and the pump head all need SATA power as well as any drives you're putting in there. So I actually ended up using two cables for that so make sure you've got enough cabling for that. Then we've got the wiring for those front fans on the radiator. So as I showed, we've got the splitter cable for that. So I'm making sure I've got a split for those and then we plug in the rest of them. So we've got four fans to plug into the three fan connector on the pump head. So what I ended up doing is making sure I'm using the one closest. So that four pin one and then the others. So that is the option. Now, not necessarily recommended, but worth bearing in mind. So quick demonstration that I forgot to plug in the SATA power cable so I had one plugged in already but I actually ended up needing two so it's well worth planning your build before you start because as you can see it's a bit difficult to sort of work that SATA cable in to the power supply unit at this stage where things are a bit messy and a bit busier so it's definitely worth doing this beforehand before you install your power supply unit so don't make the mistakes that I've done and that's why I like to do it like this to show you things to avoid during the build process so hopefully you find that useful
but also to make sure you plug all those SATA connections in. If you miss any of them, then the RGB not, might, might not work. The pump might not work. The USB connections might not work. So it's very important to secure all those things. Now, this is another splitter cable that I've got, a Y splitter cable. And that's for the bottom front intake fan and the rear exhaust fan. So I'm combining those two together. You don't necessarily need to do this. You could just plug them separately into the system fan header. But I'm doing this just because it makes life a little bit easier because all the system fan headers are down the bottom. So I'm basically extending the length of those cables, then plugging them in. Then I'm connecting up the 24 pin power cable, which as you can see, is a little bit tricky to manipulate past that cable hiding tray, but that tray doesn't make it a little bit easier. To see more easily the view, this is what it looks like outside the case. So you just plug it in like that, make sure the clips over it and it's pushed in well, because that power cable needs to be seated down properly or it won't power on. And then we can hide away some of those things. Then USB-A and USB-C connections for that top panel. So again, as I showed earlier, they plug in on the right hand side. You need to make sure these are secured well, otherwise those front connections won't work. And you can see there's a little notch on that. Now this will be the same for most motherboards. So generally speaking, this is the way you'd connect those up. And don't forget, if you also want to use hard disk drives and SSDs, you'll need to connect up the SATA data cables as well, which is in the bottom right of the motherboard there. Then front panel connection, all important, because if you don't plug this in, the power button won't work. So you need to run that as well. So this comes from the front, as I showed earlier on, you need to run that down here to the bottom right, and that plugs in. You'll see that there's one pin missing on the cable itself, so one hole is missing, so you can't actually get this the wrong way around. And then that's all connected up. So now, before I install the GPUs, we'll make sure everything powers on nicely. So plug the power cable in, turn it on and just check. All the fans are spinning, all the RGBs on, and the pump head is working as it should be. You can see as standard, it just displays the liquid temperature and all the fans are set to white, but we can get more of that later on. Then I'm going about installing the GPU. Now, one of the things to bear in mind with this push-pull setup and the way I've mounted the radiator with the tubes down could potentially block your GPU. You can see with the 3090 that does fit in there, but as I mentioned, I actually couldn't fit a 4090 in with this positioning. So space is a bit more limited. If those front fans weren't there on the radiator, you'd have a bit more space. And obviously top mounting the radiator would give you more room for your GPU. So if you've got a particularly long GPU, top mounting a radiator is actually a much more sensible choice because you'd have quite a significant amount more room there. I have had people comment that the pump is set up in the wrong direction, but actually that's not the case. As long as the CPU block is not the highest point in the build, then it's not a problem because you won't have any air bubbles causing you issues. And this is a good fitment for the radiator. Now we need to make sure the GPU cables are set up. This is a 30 series that requires two 8 pin connectors. So you just got to push those PCIe power cables together, make sure they're clipped in nicely and pushed all the way and seated properly. And then that will ensure that that runs nicely and gives you those good graphics processing power. A nice setup so far. You can see pretty clean from the front. Yes, my rear cabling is a mess, but the door does go on. So <laughs> that is actually one nice benefit of this case that despite my awful cable management, that case does go back together quite nicely. And here you can see the end result. Now this is what it looks like as standard before you get into Windows. You need to go into Windows and download the CAM software. I've detailed some of this on the all-in-one video, so if you want to see the Kraken Elite Cooler video, then I'll show you what to do in there. But if you go into that, you can then control the fan speed and the lighting effects. You will notice that obviously we've got that rear single fan, which is only black. Unfortunately, I didn't have another RGB fan, but you could either remove that fan or put an RGB fan in there as well. So you've got another fan, you could stick that back there. That'd probably look a bit nicer. But once you've got the door on, which is partly tinted, then you can't really see a lot of lighting anyway. And it will depend on you know your budget and what you want to do with it, whether you want to put more RGB on there. But I'm pretty happy with how this looks. It's got a nice design on it. Obviously, you can see that single bottom fan which isn't connected up to the radiator, kind of lonely down there, but that does give good airflow for the hard disk drive. So you've still got good airflow down the bottom and it's actually nestled away quite nicely. And then the setup's really good. Now, another highlight of this cooler, as you can see, is that you can have both GIFs and dual information about your CPU temperatures. You can also choose from a variety of different things. So you can see CPU and GPU, you can get liquid readouts, you can get a clock, 
You can just do straight GIFs. There's all sorts of other things. And all that RGB is nicely controllable from the CAM software. So hopefully you found this video useful. Don't forget to check out the links in the description to other related videos. Find out about the specs of the case and of this build if you're interested. And subscribe if you haven't already to see more. Thanks very much for watching. You've made it right to the end of the video, you brilliant legend you. If you've enjoyed it, click that subscribe button, give me a thumbs up, and drop me a comment down below if you've got any questions. If you really enjoyed it, consider joining the channel and see the benefits of doing so. Check out these other videos. You might well find them interesting or useful. And most importantly, have a great life.